In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is the final Sunday of the church calendar year. Advent, which begins next Sunday, ushers in a new church season, brings us into Christmas, and is also the beginning of a new lectionary cycle. Now, in the Episcopal Church, we follow a three-year lectionary cycle which is conveniently dubbed years A, B, and C. In year C, we generally read from St. Luke's Gospel. In year B, we generally read from St. Mark's Gospel. And in year A, the year that we are currently in and concluding, we generally read from St. Matthew's Gospel. For those of you paying attention, we also do read from St. John's Gospel, but there's no single year devoted to that. St. John is sort of peppered in to every single year in little chunks. Since today is our final gospel from St. Matthew for a while, I think it is appropriate to give you an overview of one of my favorite saints and how his life and overall gospel narrative help us to interpret today's gospel passage, the parable of the Last Judgment, or the, also called the parable of the sheep and the goats. Many Christians probably know of St. Matthew uh, as being an apostle and an evangelist. He's an apostle because he's listed among the 12 disciples that made up Jesus's inner circle. And he's an evangelist because he is credited with being the author of one of the Gospels, a book we know as the Gospel according to Matthew. Now, in chapter 9 of his Gospel, we read about how Matthew, the tax collector, became a disciple of Christ, and I'll read that to you. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him, and as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Now, if we read the other gospel accounts of this same event, we learn that Matthew was also called Levi, and that this dinner was actually in Levi's, Matthew's, home. At that dinner, Jesus is confronted about the company he keeps, and he uses the opportunity to explain that God's mercy and love are not only for the righteous, but also and especially for sinners. I think it's fair to say that St. Matthew knew exactly what it felt like to be a person whose mere presence made other people uncomfortable. We all know what that feels like. By career, by reputation, and by default, St. Matthew was a sinner, and as such, someone who decent people should and would avoid. And yet, Jesus does not avoid people like that. Jesus invites them to join him. Jesus feels comfortable having them as his disciples. Jesus even feels comfortable going over to their houses, and he calls and considers them friends. I believe that St. Matthew can relate to anyone who has ever been bullied or felt like the least in a crowd full of the greatest, or even in a crowd full of those that think and act like they are the greatest. He can also relate to any outcast who has ever been welcomed and loved unexpectedly. Each gospel has unique elements to it, and some of Jesus' most cherished teaching on mercy and on love comes exclusively from St. Matthew. There are many passages and sayings unique to St. Matthew, but perhaps the most quoted is the Beatitudes, which are also in Luke, but in a much abbreviated form. You, you know them, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is coming from St. Matthew or through St. Matthew. St. Matthew offers words of comfort to anyone who has suffered by making it crystal clear that God loves us all, even if the world does not. At the same time, St. Matthew holds those who have experienced God's love and mercy to a very high standard. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That comes from St. Matthew's Gospel. That tension is probably summed up best in the last parable in the Gospel, which is the Last Judgment, which is also unique to St. Matthew's Gospel, and which is today's Gospel. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. And truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. We know these. This is the summary of the parable. This is the challenge also of the baptismal covenant, the promises that Christians make and regularly renew when they commit themselves to Christ and a life following the teachings and commands of Jesus to love everyone. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Now the challenge issued by St. Matthew to all who believe in Jesus is the same challenge we accept whenever we renew our baptismal vows or when we made them in the first place. It is the challenge that can be easy to accept, but prove far more difficult to live out on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, just because something is hard doesn't mean that we don't keep trying. When the world has thrown someone down, it is our duty as people who know what it feels like to be down there. It is our duty as people who know God's love and have experienced it directly through the hands of others lifting us up. It is our duty as the people of God to do everything that we can possibly do to heal the wounded, to lift up the fallen, to welcome in those who are cast out, and to show mercy to all who suffer. All. That duty doesn't change just because our nation or our town is deeply divided. And the voices of divisive people are the loudest right now. It still doesn't change that duty. In fact, I'd argue that times like now are exactly when the world most needs Christians. Real Christians who are honestly trying their best to love their neighbors, even when their neighbors seem to be their enemies. The world needs people who are going to hear Jesus's words at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel and act in a godly and loving way on them. Listen to them again. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. Love your enemy when your enemy is your neighbor. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.